Hey, thank you all for, for coming. Um, uh, as Miriam said, I'm Alex Burns. I'm with Politico. I'm one of our uh, two uh, bloggers sort of anchoring our election coverage. Um, I'll be here in Washington on election night, but just came back from Nevada, which is, of course, a very important swing state. Uh, a little closer. Um, so I want to just give a couple sort of brief overview thoughts on where the campaign is right now uh, and then get pretty quickly to what your questions are. Um, we find ourselves on the eve of the election with the preponderance of swing state polling uh, suggesting that the president is headed for a, a narrow win uh, tomorrow. Uh, in these national polls, you see that Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are very, very closely matched. They're usually separated by just one or two points uh, in either direction within the margin of error. But the important polls to look at are the ones out in the individual states like Ohio and Florida, uh, Virginia, Nevada, Wisconsin, uh, because what really matters is which candidate can get to 270 electoral votes. Uh, most, of those polling, mo most of those polls suggest that the president is uh, very, very slightly ahead in most of those states. It's within the margin of error in most places, so there's a very, very real possibility uh, that Governor Romney ends up winning tomorrow night, but it would be considered something uh, of an upset uh, if, despite all polls out of Ohio, practically uh, all polls out of places like Nevada and uh, New Hampshire showing the president ahead if Romney were to win uh, anyway. Uh, it's a cliche in American elections, and I imagine in most elections, that uh, at the end of the day what matters is turnout, uh, which voters actually show up at the polls. Probably, I don't know if we have anyone from Australia here, but I guess where you have compulsory voting, that's not such a big uh, wild card. Um, but here, the big question mark is always who is actually going to show up and participate. Uh, the reason why the Romney campaign believes that it still has a reasonably good shot at winning this election is because they think that the uh, voting population is going to look more like it did eight years ago in 2004 when President Bush got reelected uh, than it did in 2008 when Barack Obama got elected in the first place. Uh, four years ago, the president benefited from a historic participation by young voters, non-white voters, uh, and by winning uh, by significant margins among independent uh, voters and uh, women voters. He's not going to win by a big margin or maybe at all among independent voters this year. So if the president wins, it's going to be because he has offset his losses among independents by picking up even more support among those groups that voted at historic levels in 2008, Latino voters, young voters, uh, unmarried women, other groups that traditionally vote more liberal but don't necessarily participate uh, at the highest rates. The Romney campaign is making the bet that we are going to have a somewhat uh, wider, somewhat more, somewhat more conservative, somewhat older electorate than we had four years ago, which is why you see him campaigning in places like uh, Pennsylvania, which is a traditionally Democratic state, but has a large population of white voters and independent voters that he believes could swing to him uh, in this race. Just to sort of zoom out beyond that, uh, in the big picture, the, the most significant issue in the election is still the economy. But I think you have to consider that at this point, it's maybe a bit less of a liability for the president than it was a year ago. Uh, Romney got into this race on the theory that he'd be able to win the Republican primary because he was the most, uh, the strongest candidate for the general election against Obama and that he was the strongest candidate for the general election against Obama because he, uh, Mitt Romney, has strong credentials on the economy and Barack Obama has weak credentials on the economy. Most of that is still true, that the president, if you look at public opinion polls, his approval rating on the economy and jobs is still poor. Uh, but because we've seen this sort of steady uh, downward movement in the unemployment rate, that it's now below 8 percent, if only just below 8 percent, uh, some of the mood in the country that existed when Romney launched his campaign 17 months ago has dissipated a little bit. That there's not the same sense that there was in 2010 of just enormous pent-up frustration and anger uh, at Washington and at the White House over uh, the condition of the economy. That the president is now out there campaigning and saying that things are basically moving in the right direction. It's still not a slam dunk for him to make that case, and there's still a lot of frustration, but it's a more plausible case for Obama to make now than it was at the beginning of the race. Um, so let me, let me just uh, uh, answer whatever is on your minds. I'm happy to talk about the presidential race, the states, if you want to talk about the Senate and Congress. Your name and media organization. Sweden. Have you seen any 
impact from Sandy on the election? You know, I think you heard over the last couple of days some prominent Republicans like Karl Rove, uh, the former Bush advisor, Haley Barber, uh, the former governor of Mississippi, saying pretty explicitly that they think the storm was helpful to the president. Uh, not necessarily because people saw how the president handled the storm and chose to vote for him uh, where they might have otherwise voted for Romney, but because there was this sense of sort of gathering momentum behind the Romney campaign. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of talk about this idea that uh, Romney's, you know, polling numbers were on a steady upward uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, and then for a week, we really stopped talking about the campaign, just period. You didn't hear about it in national news. And then, any, you know, any president uh, in a moment of crisis, any president who's seen uh, on the ground in a situation of devastation, you know, there's, there's typically some sympathy, some public uh, rallying around that person. Um, I think there's some reason for skepticism of that assessment that, you know, certainly the storm didn't hurt Nobody. the president. Um, but even before the storm hit, there were signs that Romney's momentum was leveling off a little bit. Uh, you know, he clearly got a bump out of that first debate in Denver, a big bump out of that first debate in Denver. But, you know, he didn't knock out the president in either of the two successive debates. And if you look at a state like Ohio or a state like Nevada or Wisconsin, you know, you can see that the poll, that, that Romney sort of moved up in the polling and then either plateaued or dipped back down a little bit. And that was before the storm hit. So, you know, I think you can make the argument that Romney would be better off right now if the storm hadn't happened. I think that's a perfectly reasonable case to make because the challenger candidate in these kinds of races always needs to close with a very strong message. And the storm made that difficult. But the idea that Romney was on track to win and then the storm, uh, you know, broke his campaign, I think that's uh, pretty dubious. Yeah. Christoph von Marshall from the German Daily Der Tagesspiegel. Another Devika is doing something for, for what? Andrew. I don't ask. I don't oh, want to even ask. Yeah, okay. yeah we need Let's a mic sure holder. She knows I'll take care of it. Please. Yeah. Good. I can go ahead or? No, please. Yeah, okay. So, Christoph Marshall from the German Daily Der Tagesspiegel. I just want to know how reliable, in your opinion, are the polls at all? I mean, we are all trying to follow that, but there's this debate whether they have still the right technique. What about cell phone voters, landline voters? How do you get to the electorate, which is really going to vote and not only pretending that they are possible voters? What do you make up of that? That's a big question since the margins of error of the polls are three or four percentage points and the two campaigns are just 0 0.7 or maybe 1% right. apart. So, Right. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, if Romney wins tomorrow, I think it's a real sort of day of reckoning for the polling industry that if you look day to day over the weekend and today, uh, the great majority of polls from the swing states have shown the president ahead. Slightly ahead, but ahead. If Romney wins anyway, I think there's going to be a real outcry uh, about, well, why were all these polls wrong? And as you say, you know, many of them aren't actually wrong. Uh, if you show the president up two points with a four-point margin of error and Romney wins by two, the poll wasn't wrong. Uh, it's just that there's variation and, and error in sampling. Um, but that's not how polls typically get reported. And I think that uh, you would, I think after this campaign, particularly if Romney wins, you're going to see a lot more caution in the national media about how to talk about polling, how to assess uh, the state of the race. As far as whether polls, by and large, are accurate, I, I, you know, personally, as a reporter, I don't put too much stock in any individual, in any individual poll. But if you take them all together, some pretty clear trends typically emerge. Uh, you know, if you look over this last weekend, on Friday night, you had one poll from the Miami Herald showing Romney ahead in the state of Florida by six points. And the same night, you had a poll from NBC and the Wall Street Journal showing that Obama was ahead by two in the state. Uh, I don't know what you can really take away from that except for the fact that Florida is a very, very competitive state, uh, and it always is. Um, on the other hand, you have a state like Ohio, where in the last two weeks, you have polls from CNN, Time Magazine, uh, public policy polling, a couple other pollsters showing the president ahead by three to five points. That's a pretty stable trend. So I think we, you know, I, I, personally, I wouldn't bet my life on any one of these results. But when you have a stable trend of the president being ahead by a couple points in a state or Romney being ahead by a couple points in a state the way we've had in a place like North Carolina, um, that I put some stock in. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
Good afternoon. My name is Dagmar Beneshova. I'm from World Business Press Online News Agency. My question is, uh, the latest news from the US economy, such as unemployment, you already mentioned, how could they influence the decision of right now undecided voters, how large they can have an impact? And one more question, please. Could you please figure out or lay out some brief vision how the economy could develop when, for example, Barack Obama will be re-elected or if there will be like m major shift uh, when uh, Mitt Romney? Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I think that, you know, month to month there's been this uh, expectation in the political press that the unemployment report would substantially change the race in one way or another. That when it ticks up, uh, there was one month where I think it went from 8.3 to 8.5. Uh, a lot of people in my line of work immediately assumed this is terrible for the president and his numbers are going to take a hit. And I think there's also the assumption that uh, in October, when the unemployment rate dropped from, I think it was 8.1 to 7.8. Well, that's great news for Obama. His polling numbers should improve. Neither of those things really happened. Uh, so you, I, I think we are at a point in the, in the race where voters' perceptions of the economy are pretty much fixed. And they have been for a while. Because at the end of the day, if you're a voter in Ohio or in Virginia or Iowa, you're not basing your perception of the economy on this abstract number that's reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You're basing your perception of the economy on whether members of your family have, a jo have jobs or your neighbor has a job or if you can afford to buy what you want to buy at the supermarket or how much you have to pay for uh, gasoline. So, you know, I think that we have tended in the U.S. press to overestimate the political impact uh, of those jobs reports. As far as the direction of uh, economic policy, depending on who wins this election, a couple months ago, I think a lot of people would have anticipated, you know, potentially some really significant changes if Romney were to win, because a couple months ago it looked like Republicans could win control of the Senate uh, and take the presidency and keep control of the House of Representatives, which would have given Romney uh, the kind of opportunity that Obama had at the beginning of his term to have total control of the federal government and really an ability to do things like uh, revise or repeal Obama's uh, bank regulations, his health care law, things like that. Uh, it now looks pretty unlikely that Republicans are going to take control of the Senate. So, and it looks very unlikely that Democrats will take control of the House. So whichever uh, party wins the presidential election, we're, we're still going to have divided control in Washington. Uh, and I think it's kind of anyone's guess whether anyone will be able to get anything done under those conditions. And I think it's a big question mark whether uh, Governor Romney or whether President Obama has an agenda for the economy that could potentially get any bipartisan support at all. Uh, to me, I, I tend to be more pessimistic about these things. I think the safe bet is that not very much changes. Uh, you know, the president has not implemented much in the way of economic policy in the last two years. It'd be surprising. Uh, if Governor Romney were more successful facing a Democratic Senate uh, than the president has been facing a Republican House. You had a question. Thank you. Irina Gerasko, Macedonian TV from Macedonia. Uh, what uh, turnout is to be expected uh, on these elections? And is it true that uh, the bigger turnout, uh, it means uh, uh, win uh, for President uh, Obama? And also, what was the turnout in 2008? Gosh, I don't know what the exact uh, uh, figure was for turnout in 2008, but it was in 2008 it was higher than 2004, 2004 was higher than 2000, 2000 was higher than 1996. Uh, th in the view of the Obama campaign, the trends in turnout have, uh, you know, ever since 1992, so for the last 20 years. Each election you have seen more participation across the board, and you have seen more participation by non-white voters. So in each election since 1992, uh, the percentage of the electorate that's white has gone down by three to four percentage points. And the size of the overall electorate has increased by a couple percentage points as a share of the total population. So if you ask the Obama campaign, their view is uh, we are going to have turnout that is equal to or greater than 2008, and the electorate is going to look similar to the way it did four years ago. The view of the Romney campaign is that 2008 was an anomaly in a lot of ways, that Barack Obama was a unique candidate running at a unique moment, and he was able to gain support and 
uh, turnout voters from corners of the electorate that don't typically participate in high rates, uh, and that you know the Romney campaign's expectation, at least the last time I heard, was that you would have probably fewer Latino voters this time than you did previously. You'd probably have fewer young people than you did last time. Uh, you might have fewer people overall. Um, I can't stand here and tell you definitively uh, which bet is the better one. If you look at early voting in states, because you know some states vote only on November 6th, some states allow people to vote in the you know several weeks or days before Election Day, early voting suggests that turnout is pretty strong. Uh, in a state like North Carolina or Florida, turnout uh, in early voting uh, may exceed what it did four years ago. Um, and the big question there is, does that mean those are new people voting, that overall turnout will be more than it was four years ago, or is it that those are people who would ordinarily vote on Election Day and they're voting early and so it doesn't change the overall pool of voters that much? We really don't know. If we knew the answer, we could probably tell you who was going to win the presidential election. Yeah. I thought there was somebody I, there. doesn't matter. Just somebody. Okay, go ahead. Uh, who was? Go ahead. Alexander Gasiuk, Rosyska Gazeta, Russia. Could you could you give us an idea of the state of congressional race as well? Thank you. The House of Representatives or the House and Senate? Um, you know the the uh, the expectation in both parties is probably that the two houses of Congress will stay stay more or less where they are. Uh, Democrats hoped uh, after 2010 that they would be able to make up some ground this year in the House because Republicans uh, elected a whole bunch of pretty uh, weak candidates two years ago who now have to run for re-election in a less Republican year. Uh, what's more, you had the, uh, every 10 years, we redraw the congressional maps in this country for the House of Representatives, and Democrats were very optimistic that by redrawing maps in uh, New York and Illinois and California, they'd be able to pick up a whole bunch of seats. For a variety of reasons, it doesn't look like that has panned out for them. Um, in some respects, it's just because Republicans have done a very good job of uh, recruiting candidates. Democrats have done an inconsistent job of recruiting candidates. Republicans have benefited from a big financial advantage in a lot of races uh, where Democrats have not. Uh, and then overall, the mood of the country has not, you know, it's not as Republican uh, or not as pro-Republican uh, an atmosphere as it was two years ago. But I, you know, I don't think anyone would go as far as to say that we're in a pro-Democratic year, that we're going to have a Democratic wave. So the House probably stays the same. Um, the Senate will also probably stay the same, maybe exactly the same. Uh, right now there are uh, 53 Democrats, uh, 47 Republicans. Or to be exact, there are 50, 51 Democrats, uh, two independents who caucus with the Democrats and 47 Republicans. Those numbers right now uh, look like they will either stay exactly the same or maybe move one seat to the Republicans. Um, and that has a lot to do with individual candidates and individual races, that Republicans have ended up with a couple, uh, I'm trying to think of a polite word for this, but incredibly bad candidates uh, in a couple very, very important races. So if you look at the Missouri Senate race, the Indiana Senate race, uh, even the North Dakota Senate race, which Republicans may still win, uh, you have elections where Democrats have ended up with, you know, running in conservative states with strong Democratic candidates against weak Republican candidates. And so if you have a strong Democrat and a weak Republican in a Republican state, that's a very competitive election. Um, and on top of that, you have uh, Democrats have caught a couple, couple lucky breaks in that uh, Republican Senator Olympia Snow retired in Maine. That's going to go to an independent that will, who will probably caucus with the Democrats. And then they, Democrats are pretty confident that they'll be able to uh, defeat Senator Scott Brown in Massachusetts with Elizabeth Warren. Uh, that's just a very, very Democratic state. Brown has run a fine campaign. He's a popular senator, but it's just a very, very Democratic state. Excuse me. The next question, we're going to go to New York, please. New York. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, this is for Radio uh, France International, uh, French Public Radio. Uh, two questions about um, these lawsuits that, you know, all legal, uh, legal battle that started yesterday in some states, swing states between Republicans and Democrats. How this is going to affect the results, the, the counting the, 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 the votes? tomorrow uh, in those state, in these states. And second, about the Hurricane Sandy um, that affected like uh, New York State and 
New Jersey, how this um, um, thing is going to affect the voters because, you know, uh, some people maybe they don't have gas to take the car and go to vote. They have to change the locations of the poll sites. Uh, how do you think this is going to impact? Uh, well, to take your first question first, uh, I think ever since the 2000 election, which was, of course, decided by 500 votes and a lawsuit in Florida, uh, campaigns have had this mentality of uh, sue first and ask questions later. So you are seeing a lot of lawyers deployed to different states and a lot of, uh, you have a lot of alarm and anxiety on both sides about voting irregularities, people who weren't able to vote before the polling sites closed. Uh, I'm not sure which litigation you're referring to in particular, but in Florida there's a very big controversy uh, about whether the governor should extend early voting hours or should have extended early voting hours. He didn't. Um, it's difficult to say how much of this uproar is genuine from the parties and how much of it is based on a real sense that this could change the outcome of the election and how much it's uh, just precautionary that if Democrats lose Florida by a thousand votes, they're going to blame the governor for, for not extending early voting. Uh, in a state like Ohio, there was a whole, uh, just a whole mess of, of, of uh, confrontations in court over the summer uh, about uh, what the early voting period would look like. Democrats basically came out on top of that one. Um, so I can't tell you definitively uh, who is going to come out on top in the litigation, but if this is a very, very close election, uh, I think the sort of nightmare scenario for everyone involved is that we would end up in weeks of recounts and lawsuits uh, at the same time as Congress is supposedly uh, going to be trying to confront a, a major sort of fiscal meltdown. Um, and on the question of whether Sandy will affect the vote, uh, it will certainly affect the process of voting in uh, New Jersey and in parts of New York. Uh, the state of New Jersey has laid out some measures where people can cast their ballots electronically uh, because some voting sites are not going to be able to uh, open. New York is, is you know, taking some measures as well. There are places in Connecticut that could be affected. Um, you know, on the presidential level, that, that will not affect the electoral vote count. It won't affect the actual outcome because those are very, very Democratic states. Um, there is some uh, sense on the Democratic side that if it's a really close election and 50,000 people stay home in New Jersey because it's inconvenient and 50,000 in New York and 50,000 in Connecticut, that maybe it could affect the popular vote margin between Obama and Romney. Um, but that's totally speculative right now. And frankly, if the election is that close, uh, we're kind of in a mess with or without the storm. Uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. Um, I'm just wondering if you personally have been um, following the campaigns on the stumps very much, and if so, what's your impression about, about the different moods between when you go to a Romney campaign um, rally and, and an Obama campaign rally? Uh, personally, I've been struck by the, I, I guess I would say the lack of energy on both sides, that if there's more energy on one side, it's probably the Romney campaign, that his base is somewhat more fired up than the president's is. But you don't have the sense now that you had in 2008, or even in some races in 2010, uh, of just electric uh, energy on both sides. Um, and I think that just has a lot to do with the mood of the country overall and the level of connection and, com and commitment to the candidates that people have, that the president's base, uh, all indications are the president's base is going to turn out, um, but they're going to do it out of a sense of obligation more than a sense of uh, exuberance the way they did four years ago. Uh, for the Romney campaign, there's a lot of energy, but it's more about beating Barack Obama than it is about uh, this sort of overwhelming affection for Mitt Romney. So, you know, you go to a, I was at an Obama event in uh, Las Vegas on Thursday, and his big applause lines are, we killed Osama bin Laden, and we ended the wars, uh, in, we ended the war in Iraq, we're ending the war in Afghanistan. Um, you know, a lot of the lines about the economy, you don't, you know, it's not the same sense in 2008 that sort of whatever you throw out to the crowd, they're going to go nuts. Um, uh, on the Romney side, uh, there is a lot of excitement around this idea that, you know, over the weekend they were chanting four more days at his rally, meaning four more days until he beat Barack Obama as opposed to four more years 
uh, of the Obama administration. But you know, you don't have uh, Romney is not a speaker the way George W. Bush was a speaker, or uh, the way some of his surrogates like Marco Rubio or Chris Christie are speakers. So you know, you don't have Romney whipping up the crowd in an incredible sense of uh, excitement about Mitt Romney. Um, the other striking thing about the rallies that I, I mentioned before is uh, just the composition of, of the support uh, that both candidates have. You go to an Obama rally um, in most places, and you're looking at a, a uh, I don't know, but I, I don't know if largely, but really significantly non-white uh, audience for Obama and for Romney. That's obviously not the case. We'll go to New York. New York, your question, please. Thank you. Uh, Andy Batag, Fuji TV. Uh, as we cover this event tomorrow, um, we're going to keep in a lot of attention on the exit polls. And uh, certainly in uh, 2004, we had some difficulty with them. How reliable do you think the exit polls are, and do you think that system is fixed? Is fixed? How reliable do you think the exit polls will be tomorrow? With exit polls, you want to proceed with even more caution than you do with regular polls, because you only get to take an exit poll once. So it's not like you can say, over a period of three weeks, exit polls in Ohio showed this consistent trend, right? You can only take them tomorrow. Um, you know, when you uh, add to that the fact that many people are not voting on election day, that they're voting in early voting, uh, you know, that adds another level of, well, just what really can we learn from exit polls? Um, you know, I'm glad that they take the exit polls because what you can do after the fact is, you know, you look at the results in an exit poll and then you can look at the actual results of the election in a state like Nevada. And then you can, you know, if the exit poll says that uh, 40, you know, 40 percent of the people who voted were Democrats, when in reality 38 percent of the people who voted were Democrats, you can then reweight the exit poll and, and sort of adjust the whole data set to reflect the real electorate, and then you can learn some pretty interesting things about who voted and why. Um, that's not that useful in terms of calling an election in real time. And, you know, generally speaking, I would expect people to show real caution tomorrow night just because of the closeness of this race. Um, if you saw a state like Ohio or a state like Virginia, uh, if you saw that uh, Mitt Romney was doing really not particularly well on Election Day, that would be pretty ominous for him because the president is expected to be ahead, especially in Ohio, North Carolina, Florida, in early voting. Um, so Romney needs to win those states on Election Day convincingly. Um, if we were to get an indication from exit polls that it was tied or if Obama was winning, that would be an ominous sign for Romney. Um, but beyond that, uh, beyond a, you know, a real surprising underperformance by Romney on uh, November 6th, you know, I think people are going to be pretty, uh, pretty tentative about the way they use those results tomorrow. Where is the Tea Party moment this year? It's a great question. Um, you obviously didn't see an enormous um, presence for the Tea Party in the presidential primaries. Uh, it's hard to imagine a candidate like Mitt Romney being nominated as the Republican presidential candidate in, you know, by a Republican electorate with the same uh, mood and same set of priorities that they had in 2010. Um, but there's always been sort of a debate about the Tea Party, whether it was a unique uh, a new force in American politics and in Republican politics, uh, or whether it was essentially a new label and a different way of identifying, you know, a pretty consistent part of the Republican base. Uh, you know, the Tea Party movement, by and large, you're looking at uh, a pretty suburban population. You're looking at a white population, uh, very concerned about fiscal issues, conservative on social issues, but prioritizing fiscal issues over social issues. Um, that's a group that's always been part of the Republican coalition, or at least in the last you know, 20 years, um, 30 years. Uh, so I think what you see this year is that the Tea Party, you know, Tea Party voters are still participating, but they maybe they're calling themselves Republicans, um, which they were in the first place. Um, you know, you have seen in, in uh, Senate elections and in House elections uh, where that group continues to have uh, outsized impact is in low turnout elections where the party base can choose 
a candidate based more on its ideological uh, priorities than anything else. That's why you ended up with a candidate like Todd Akin in the Missouri Senate race, uh, or why you ended up with a candidate like Richard Murdoch over uh, Dick Lugar in the Indiana Senate race. Um, but again, it's if the, if the Tea Party is just a way of describing uh, a, a highly energized and active and engaged Republican Party base, they're still there. They're just not necessarily commanding the same influence in a higher turnout election. Uh, may I follow up on that one and challenge one thing you predicted for if we have this outcome which we have today, President Obama, uh, majority for the Republicans in the House, the Senate uh, with the Democrats, that not much is changing. Couldn't there be a slight possibility that if the Republicans don't win the White House and if they can't take the Senate, that it starts a reckoning, first of all, why? And second, they will try to look at 2016, at least a few days after this election. So maybe one conclusion could be, not from the first day, not without discussion inside the party, that they can't uh, continue to be the party of no because otherwise they can't take the White House in 2016. So I, I, I'm not trying to predict that, but um, isn't there a possibility that the psychology, how uh, the makeup of the White House and Congress would be, even if we have the same uh, phenomenons, would be different, psychologically different, because we have to, to look at 2016? Yes, I think, I think there's a strong chance of that, and I think that there will be an internal debate in the Republican Party. There's an article on uh, Politico.com today predicting that there will be a major internal debate within the Republican Party whether or not Mitt Romney wins this election. Um, you know, in the event that everything stays the same, um, I think Republicans are going to have to think about why. Uh, and the same is true on the Democratic side, by the way, if, if Obama were to lose. But if... You know, the pre if the president wins re-election, it's going to be because he managed to shift a lot of blame for the state of the country onto a Republican House of Representatives because he was able to exploit issues like immigration and abortion to uh, drive groups like uh, independent women and like Latino voters who were already leaning to the Democrats toward him in historic numbers. Uh, and you're going to have, you know, Republicans are going to have to ask themselves, how can we stop this from happening again? Um, if Obama wins in a climate of 8% unemployment where his approval rating on the economy is really pretty dismal, uh, and the Republicans have a perfectly inoffensive candidate for the White House, even if he's not necessarily inspiring to a lot of people, um, you know, there, there, there will be sort of self-scrutiny. What, how, how, did we, how did we screw that up? Um, and some of that will be a matter of establishment Republicans and moderate Republicans saying, you know, we can't continue nominating people like Todd Akin and Richard Murdoch. There will be, uh, you know, some folks in the party have already been out there saying we have got to figure out a way to work around uh, the issue of immigration because, you know, Republicans cannot, even if Romney manages to win this year, despite overwhelming opposition from Latino voters, the demographics look pretty ugly if you look ahead to 2016 and 2020 for a party that loses non-white voters by these margins. So I think that conversation is going to happen in that party regardless of the outcome. On the Democratic side, by the way, if Obama loses, uh, you know, Democrats will tell themselves, and they won't be wrong, that he, had, he was dealt a bad economic hand from the beginning and was never really able to get out from under that. But I think the party will, you know, that party will have to... Uh, ask itself some questions about how does it get real credibility on balancing the budget and how does it reckon with the fact that, you know, health care was the Democratic, national health care was the Democratic Party's dream for two generations. Uh, they've achieved it. It's not popular. Um, if Obama loses, Democrats are going to have to reconsider some assumptions about what the American people want from their government. Over there. Hi, thank you. Sonia Schott with Globovision Venezuela. You mentioned the immigration <coughs> issue, but it seems to that both candidates, they are not taking serious this issue. And I, I, I would like to know, what, how do you think the Latino population will make or could make the difference in these <coughs> elections? Thank you. Well, it's pretty straightforward how the Latino population makes a difference. Uh, there was a poll out this morning showing that Barack Obama leads Mitt Romney with Latinos nationally by 49 points. If 
that poll is correct, he will get a higher percentage of the Latino vote than Bill Clinton did in 1996, which <coughs> is the all-time high. And he will beat Romney among Latinos by, thir by 13 points more than he beat John McCain in 2008. You know, a lot of Latino voters live in places like New York and uh, Texas and California, which are obviously not competitive states. But if you look at Virginia, <coughs> Colorado, Nevada, and Florida, those are four states that could decide the election, significant Latino populations in all of them. In some of them, Obama leads Romney by an even <laughs> wider margin than he does nationally. You know, that's enough to swing an election. It may, it may, not, it may or may not be, but in theory, it's enough to swing an election. Um, you know, Romney and Republicans have tried to remind Latino voters that Obama had time to push for immigration reform, and he didn't. Uh, that's not party spin. That's true. Uh, he could have said, my first priority is immigration reform. Uh, instead, he passed a health care law and passed an en or the House passed an energy bill, uh, passed a stimulus, and, and you never really saw a, a major momentum behind an immigration reform initiative. Um, that has not really depressed Obama's support with Latinos, and I think Part of that is about his executive decision related to uh, the DREAM Act and deportation, uh, which was obviously enormously popular. And I think part of it is that the Republican Party is uh, not viewed as credible, period, on the issue of immigration. That you had, you know, Mitt Romney running in the Republican primaries made some decisions about how to compete against his opponents that involved some pretty strident rhetoric on immigration, and he's never really been able to get past that. So even though he has, even though Romney and other Republicans like Jeb Bush uh, have some pretty substantive criticism of Obama's record on immigration, if they are not viewed as credible themselves on the issue, it doesn't really get them very far. Oh, oh, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Minute. Yeah, I'm Francesca Barogno. I'm an Italian independent journalist. I'm a freelancer. Now, I want to know, what do you think about the Republican? Do you think with, uh, that with a different candidate, they would have been in a different position? I'm thinking not one of the, the guys who runs for the, for the primary, but I'm thinking you know, as a strongest candidate like Chris Christie or... What do you think? They would, be, they would have been in a different position right now on the polls? They would have had more chance to win? I think there are a lot of Republicans who think they'd be in a better position in the polls. Uh, you know, Obama has run a good campaign in a lot of ways, and he has exploited Romney's weaknesses far more effectively than I think a lot of people expected. The knock on Romney at the beginning of the cycle was that he was boring. Um, you know, his problem right now isn't that he's boring. His problem is that he's not sort of boring enough, uh, that if he were just a very, very bland and uninspiring guy, uh, you know, there's a, I, I could make the argument that if Romney were just a very, very bland and uninspiring generic Republican, uh, he would be ahead in this election by five points. But he's not a generic Republican. Uh, he's a Republican who the Obama campaign has managed to caricature with Romney's help uh, as this out of touch, cold, unfeeling, rich guy who doesn't understand uh, the economic hardship of ordinary people. Um, if Republicans had nominated a candidate who was pretty bland, like a Mitch Daniels or a Tim Pawlenty or a John Thune, uh, I think you can imagine it being much trickier for the Obama, the Obama campaign to uh, make that person unacceptable to voters. Uh, I think that if they had gone with a candidate like Chris Christie, if Chris Christie had decided to run, you know, the issue wouldn't be that it's hard to caricature the person. It's that Chris Christie is kind of already a caricature, uh, and he's one that the American people like. So, you know, yeah, he's sort of this larger-than-life, uh, bombastic figure, but people already know that. So, like, what are you going to do to tear him down if, that's, if voters know it and like it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of Republicans who feel that Romney has turned out to be a surprisingly weak candidate, and... Uh, in particular, this idea of his background in the financial services industry, that this is our first uh, presidential election, you know, I, this is our first presidential election since 2008, obviously, and 2008 was the election held in the middle of a global financial crisis. Uh, there's still a lot of anger in this country directed at Wall Street, directed at big banks, directed at, uh, you know, people viewed as sort of financial manipulators. And the Obama campaign and its super PAC have pretty aggressively made the case that Mitt Romney is one of those people. 
uh, whether or not that's fair, Romney has not defended himself uh, in an effective way. Um, so if you if you look at why the president is doing well in a state like Ohio, that that's a lot of the reason why. And it's hard to imagine a candidate like a Mitch Daniels or a Tim Pawlenty. You know, Tim Pawlenty never worked at a bank in his life. Probably never. Uh, you know, probably the highest salary he ever drew was as governor of Minnesota. Um, that's a harder person to tear down. Last question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, it, either way, elections turn out. Uh, uh, Madam Hillary Clinton is uh, leaving office. Uh, do you think that she will be the next uh, Democratic candidate for president in 2016 and when America will be ready for a woman president? Well, I think to take the second question first, I think there's an enormous pent up demand for a uh, woman president now. I think there was there's a, a level of disappointment that, you know, four years ago you had Hillary Clinton come very, very close to being the Democratic nominee. You had a woman nominated uh, as vice president on the Republican side, and this year you have four guys. Uh, I think the safe bet. Uh, this is something that, that some, uh, one of my colleagues uh, sort of very confidently predicts, that Romney and Ryan may be the last presidential candidate ever composed of two white men. Um, that the country is too diverse, there's too, there are too many prominent uh, female and black and Latino elected officials now for parties to kind of keep nominating these very conventional looking people. Um, I think it's part of why Republicans are so excited about the idea of Marco Rubio and Susana Martinez uh, in 2016, uh, and it's why Democrats are as excited as they are about Hillary Clinton. Um, there are a lot of uh, people on the Democratic side who supported Obama in 2008 who kind of ruefully admit in private that maybe their party would be better off if they had nominated Clinton. I don't know whether that's true or not, but we've seen Hillary Clinton and also Bill Clinton in the last four years take on this uh, this you know, they're, they're viewed as sort of bigger than politics, bigger than elections, and bigger than the political process. It's a pretty remarkable thing. I say this as somebody who, you know, grew up becoming aware of politics in the middle of the Lewinsky scandal. It's pretty remarkable to see that these, these people who were so divisive and controversial in the 1990s are now some of the most popular and unifying figures in the country. Um, Democrats certainly hope that Hillary Clinton runs in four years because uh, some population of strategists in the party believe that she would be unbeatable. Um, you know, some population of strategists in the party believe that she'd be unbeatable in 2008, and that didn't work out. Um, she says that she is not, uh, that she does not intend to run four years from now, that she's done with politics. She said there's, you know, there's a difference between having a job and having a life. Uh, and I think that a lot of people would understand if she decided at age, uh, I think she would be 68. Uh, in 2015 that she would rather just be a private citizen for once in her life. Um, my personal view uh, is that if you are somebody who is willing to commit as much time to trying to be president as she already has, and then you see an open pathway to the White House in front of you, that that's pretty hard to resist. But it's really anybody's guess, and we're going to spend, you know, particularly if Obama loses, there there will just be this enormous demand among Democrats that you know, the party needs to rally around somebody who's popular and she's the most popular person in the party. Whether or not the president wins, she's the most popular person in the party.